I recently caught up with a friend who had just turned 25. And I said to them, congratulations, you've been alive for a quarter of a century. How does it feel? And they thought for a moment and said, wow, I've been around for a long time. This aging thing is kind of getting a bit old. But I'm so excited for all of life that lies ahead of me. And their eyes lit up with this excitement and anticipation. Now, they were about to start a PhD. So in the next couple of years, that light is going to be crushed and be replaced by a look of vacant doom. But that reaction, I think, captures almost perfectly how I feel when I think about where humanity has been, but most importantly, where humanity could go. We as a species have had 5,000 years of recorded history. Now that might sound like a long time until you think about just how much further we may have left yet to go. A couple of estimates. So if we lasted as long as a typical mammalian species, we have about 200,000 years left. And there are many reasons to think that we would last longer than the typical mammalian species. So another estimate could be there's about a billion years until the Earth is sterilized by the sun. So if we were to remain on Earth, we could have a potential lifespan as a species of about a billion years. Now, if you equate a billion years as humanity's potential lifespan to, say, your human lifespan of, say, 100 years, one year in your life is 10 million years for humanity. One day in your life is 27,000 years for humanity. Humanity's been around for about 5,000 years. That is just over four hours in a human life. So we as a species, we are basically barely born. We're sitting back looking at this vast expanse of the future that lies ahead of us. And it could be huge. It could be huge, and that is an important thing, because in expectation, that means the majority of humanity's life lies in the future. There are so many potential human lives yet to be born, which could be much more magnificent than ours are now. It also means that in expectation, the majority of humanity's value lies in the future as well. Our most important discoveries, our most beautiful creations. Now, the size of the long-term future of humanity is so large, that it warrants being the top priority for our civilization to ensure that it goes well. But what does it mean exactly for it to go well? Well, we haven't really made it an explicit goal so far for our civilization to prioritize a long-term future, but at least implicitly, there are a number of ways in which we work towards this thing of making sure our long-term future sort of goes somewhat well. So economic progress is one surefire example of this. It's this cornerstone assumption, this steady drumbeat of a goal that with every decade, with every generation, we could be more economically prosperous than the previous. Intellectual progress is another dimension of this. We, one thing that makes us unique as a human species is that we consistently pursue this long-term pursuit of knowledge and truth. And finally, moral progress. We are starting to strive to be more just and altruistic and strive for less suffering in this world, although sometimes we pay less attention to that than economic growth. It's an important dimension of progress nevertheless. And so if you look at the kind of progress that we've made so far in these 5,000 years, we'll realize that there's a lot to be grateful for in terms of what we've achieved, but also we have so much more work left to do. On economic growth, we are certainly wealthier and healthier than we have been. Our quality of life is improving consistently, but there are so many more frontiers of human achievement and experience to reach so that we can reach a truly abundant society and economy for all human beings. Intellectual progress, we certainly know far more than we did about the universe, about the world, than we did centuries ago, decades ago, years ago, even days ago. But there are so many mysteries left yet to solve. The Human Genome Project and CERN are two examples of big, mega-scientific projects that we've only recently started to try to help us unpack some of these mysteries that still baffle us. And there are many mysteries that we've consistently butted our heads against that we still don't know the answer to. Like, why do we go to war? Why do we laugh? Why, when you're about to fall asleep, do you do these weird zombie twitches? And why, for buildings built in 2019, do we still install separate hot and cold taps? These are very confusing questions that consistently confuse us today. And finally, on moral progress, we are steadily making progress towards recognizing that all genders and peoples are equal, that we should consecrate and abide by a universal set of human rights, and also that we are an international community bound to each other. But we have so much more work left to do to truly reflect in our actions and our systems that all human beings across time and space carry a huge amount of moral weight. I love this quote by Edmund Burke, who captures 
as early as 1790, this beautiful intergenerational project that is building our long-term future together. He captures it as a partnership between people who are alive today, those who are dead, but also those who are yet to be born. Despite all of this progress, I posit to you that actually we don't do a very good job of optimizing for our long-term future today. Think about the short-sighted political systems and the fast-paced markets that we currently have. We could do, be, be doing far better at explicitly prioritizing the long-term future in our existing systems and our existing actions. But besides us being suboptimal at prioritizing the long-term future, we also sometimes make mistakes. We take wrong turns because we fail to prioritize a long-term future, and that causes irreversible harm to our long-term future. Take nuclear technology as an example. In less than a decade, we equipped ourselves with the ability to eliminate the majority of the world's population, and critically, locked ourselves into a future which is far less existentially safe. Fossil fuels is a historical choice that we made, which has now locked us into an energy system which is effectively a ticking time bomb. And finally, the agricultural revolution is a lesser known, more controversial example, but actually data suggests that that led to a decrease in political freedom, a decrease in health and quality of life, and an increase in within country income inequality. Scholar Jared Diamond has gone so far as to say that that revolution was the worst mistake in human history. And we simply can't afford mistakes, not when the stakes are so high in terms of what could lie ahead of us. Now, this is a call for us making the long-term future our top priority as a civilization. And I posit to you that that's just a natural thing for humanity growing up, is for us to prioritize this. Recall that we're barely four hours old. If you've ever seen a four-hour-old baby, they're really not that impressive. They can kind of breathe, and that's about it. And there's a lot of growing up left to do, same as there's a lot of growing up left for us to do as a civilization to prioritize a long-term future ahead of us. The Global Priorities Institute in Oxford captures this view under the heading of long-termism, that it should be our top priority to ensure that the long-term future goes well, and that neglecting the long-term future is a grave moral error. Now, one way in which you can make the long-term future go well is by focusing on steering the world's most powerful technologies in robustly beneficial directions for humanity. Technologies have consistently shaped our lives and our civilizations. They're a marker of our intellectual and economic progress, if you will, but our ability to develop them responsibly and safely, that's a marker of our moral progress. It's a marker of our civilizational wisdom. And artificial intelligence is one of these very powerful technologies that we're facing today. So steering the future of artificial intelligence could be one of the most critical projects for shaping the long-term future of humanity. Now, why could AI be such a big deal? Well, first off, it could be a very big deal in terms of the kinds of technological effects it could have on the world. For one, artificial intelligence could be the next big general purpose technology, or a GPT. A GPT is a type of technology which pervades all domains across the economy and can lead to sustained long-term improvements. Historical examples include the computer, the printing press, electricity, the steam engine. GPTs have been some of the most powerful technologies in our history and have steered the course of humanity as we know it. And AI could be the next big GPT. But beyond this, we could also develop artificial general intelligence, or AGI. That refers to a system or set of systems that equals or surpasses human capabilities in all domains. Now recall that humans, our intelligence is one of the main reasons, if not the main reason, why we're as powerful as we are today. So creating something that equals or surpasses that, well, that could be a very big deal, and that's a bit of an understatement. How plausible is it that we could develop something like AGI? Well, we did a survey in 2016 of about 300 top machine learning researchers and asked them the question, how long do you think it will take for us to get to something like high-level machine intelligence? Now, the median answer was a 60% chance of us getting there by, sorry, a 50% chance of us getting there by 2061. And then a 10% chance of us getting there as soon as 2025. Now, if you take that in, that is a one in 10 chance that we could get there in just over five years from today. 
I know I can barely plan my life five years in advance, much less bank on humanity planning for the biggest event in human history in that amount of time. Which brings me to why AI could be a big deal, but isn't necessarily guaranteed to be a good big deal, unless we intervene conscientiously ahead of time to ensure that we're avoiding risks along the way. Now, what exactly could those risks be? Well, the biggest risk could be a result of us actually achieving this goal of developing artificial general intelligence. Now, if we developed AGI, we'd then be seeding our status as the most intelligent entities on Earth. So we should have a really, really good plan for ensuring that these intelligent entities are safe for humanity, that they preserve things that we value, that we retain an appropriate amount of control, and that they magnify our value in the future as opposed to curtailing. Now, it could be a very difficult challenge. And how bad could it be if we don't get it right? Well, in the same survey that I mentioned before, experts placed about a one in 20 chance of us developing AGI being extremely bad for humanity. Now, if you went to a doctor and they gave you an option to take a medicine and they said, you know, this could make you superhuman in terms of your physical health, but there's about a 5% chance it might kill you and kill everything that you care about. Most of you probably wouldn't take that medicine. And for those of you who will, I really hope you're not training to be doctors because that's a very high level of risk to live with. Now, thankfully, there is a small but growing field called technical AI safety, which aims to solve this problem of how we build robustly safe AGI. These two books in particular, Superintelligence by Nick Bostrom and Human Compatible by Stuart Russell, are very exquisite articulations of why these problems are so important for us to solve. Now, the field of AI safety aims to do things like ensure that these systems can obey human commands reliably or that their goals will align with ours. But these problems are proving very, very difficult to solve. And this field needs far more investment than what we're currently putting in it. But then, even if you were to assume that we knew how to build safe AGI, or if you were a skeptic and you said, maybe we're not going to get to AGI at all, there are still substantial risks along the way to us advancing artificial intelligence generally as a technology. Now, focusing on these risks is in large part the focus of the field that I work in, AI governance. We focus on navigating this transition to a world with advanced artificial intelligence with a specific focus on long-run political, social, and economic challenges. One category of challenges that we think is most important to focus on because they're happening right now are the challenges that arise from competition over artificial intelligence. AI is a very powerful technology. And so as a result, you've seen the world's most powerful countries and powerful companies pursue it with fervor because there is a lot to gain competitively by leading in its development and deployment. This means that we should expect both state and non-state actors to rush to deploy this technology. And that could lead to reckless development and deployment, which could have substantial harm on society and for humanity. For example, you could see accidents caused unintentionally by us rushing to deploy it in high stakes context. You could also see intentional harm caused by malicious actors who want to cause societal harm. Two concrete examples I'll give you from the world of international security, which are immediate challenges, are firstly the application of AI in the cyber context. It could enable more potent cyber attacks, and it could also speed up the carrying out of cyber conflict. And this could lead to accidental escalation of a cyber conflict, which would be beyond the pace of human control. Secondly, analysts at places like RAND have warned that AI could enable an undermining of secure second strike, because you can use AI to enable counterforce attacks on mobile nuclear forces that were previously concealed. This would erode the fundamental logic of nuclear deterrence, which is currently a cornerstone assumption in what holds together international stability. Now, competition could also lead to a number of other risks which aren't directly as obvious, but are equally worrying. It could happen because, recall that when you're in comp competition, you're mostly rewarded for winning, and you're not penalized for not caring about things that you harm on the way to winning. This could lead to a dynamic which Professor Allen Defoe at Oxford calls value erosion. 
erosion of fundamental human values in the long run because of repeated compromises for performance in the short run. The intuition here is that if you're in a competitive mode as an actor and you're given two options, you can take a near-term competitive advantage or you can preserve long-term value, most folks who are in competitive mode will take the near-term advantage. And in the longer run, that could lead to a dynamic where you erode fundamental values like privacy, suffrage, safety, etc. And finally, even if you're to think all of these risks won't really impact the future of humanity and that on net advanced AI will be good for humanity, you should at least be concerned about the transition on the way to that kind of economy. Because transitions, particularly ones that are large scale and somewhat sudden driven by technology, historically have always been bumpy. Take the first industrial revolution as an example. We commonly see this as something that was a step change in difference in terms of economic utility. But actually, if you look at metrics like height, which is a good indicator of nutrition, and life expectancy, they were either stagnant or decreasing across that amount of time, and it took multiple decades for us to see consistent increases in these particular metrics. These are two metrics of multiple examples I could give you to suggest that economic transitions like the first industrial revolution, at least, was a bumpy one. We should at least expect the transition to a future with advanced AI to be equally bumpy, not least because we could potentially automate the majority, if not all, of the tasks that humans are currently performing, which could lead to a vast amount of destabilization in the economy. Now, you may think I sound quite worried, and that's because I am, but I want you to leave thinking that none of this is a foregone conclusion. Steering the governance of artificial intelligence is perhaps one of the most difficult challenges we face today, and it's difficult beyond historical measure. But we are more willing and capable to solve this problem than we ever have been before. We're more willing in that we do and we should want to prioritize the vast value that lies in our long-term future. And if we do so, that puts governing artificial intelligence at the top of our agendas. We're more capable in that we can make a dent in these challenges, particularly if we do so preemptively. I have the privilege every day of working with a small but growing community of people that are trying to tackle these challenges with as much thoughtfulness and urgency as we can. And I can tell you this much that we certainly need a lot more help. So let's end where we began. In awe of the vast potential future ahead of us. But this time, let's choose to take a hand in steering how this future goes. What does that mean? Well, that means firstly recognizing that the long-term future is brilliant and magnificent beyond our comprehension, so much so that it warrants being our top priority. It means that steering powerful technologies is perhaps one of the most important things we could do to steer ourselves towards a good long-term future. And finally, it means knowing that we have a lot of work to do to ensure that artificial intelligence in particular goes well now, but particularly in the long-term. Thanks very much.